Grace to you and peace from God the Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text today from Matthew actually extends. Uh, we cut it off at verse 8 because it was optional. And uh, because I was, as I'll tell you in a minute, writing my sermon, I decided that I was going to go deeper into chapter 10. So I want to read you just, just a few more verses. I'll pick up where we left off. The 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demon. You receive without payment, give without payment. Remember, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as servants and innocent as doves, and do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father who speaks through you. I had a sermon all written uh, yesterday morning. But yesterday morning I received an unexpected video from my Uncle Bill out in California. My Uncle Bill's 84 years old. He's crass and crude and funny. And uh, he sent me one of those videos that nobody but me should ever see. Uh, <laughs> telling jokes and making gestures that would embarrass a regular person, but I'm a pastor, so not much embarrasses me. But it was one of those closed video uh, things where, you, where your family is all involved, you know? And so in a minute, I got this tsunami of, of messages and pictures and remembrances. We all started sharing from the extended family memories of our fathers and our, and our, and our ancestors. We recalled our history. We expressed our deep longing to see each other, even though we're scattered all across this country, Ohio and Georgia and Florida and Montana and California and just about every place in between. We still talk to each other, though, which is kind of un un unique because, you know, we're from Dark County and we're all, you know, that's what you do in Dark County. You, you just can't, you never go away. You know, you're always in each other's business all the time. At any rate, after several hours of sharing, I just threw my hands up and I threw my sermon away because there was no way I was going to preach. Uh, one advantage of being in a place for 26 years is that there are days you indulge me. So today, you're going to indulge me. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to do something I normally avoid doing and, and share thoughts about Father's Day because I usually dislike contrived holidays. I'm still angry about sweetest day and the, and the demands I made upon my life, but you know. Today is Father's Day. It happens on a Sunday for a reason. And my, the memory of my father looms large with me. And also, you may not know this, this is the last Sunday that my father-in-law, Marion, a man for whom I have much respect and great affection, will be with us. He'll be in church this afternoon. And then he's, he is, as they say in the South, fixing to start a new adventure. He's going to move down to Virginia to be with his oldest son. So we won't probably see him very much after, after today. So what came to my mind uh, was, a, was a movie, uh, Big Fish. And I know I've talked about this movie perhaps in the past, but let me remind you, it's the story of a father and a son. The father's name is Edward Bloom. He is a salesman, a spinner of tall tales, and his only son, William, who spent his entire life being raised up with all of these stories, weird, wild, wonderful stories that his father told him. Bloom was a traveling salesman, and he drove a red charger. Whenever he got home, which was not often, he would regale William with all these stories of his travels. Stories about giants and werewolves, about visiting imaginary towns where everybody and everything was perfect, about joining the circus to find the identity of the one woman he'd fallen in love with at first sight, William's mother, Sandra, and even about chasing down a giant catfish that no man could ever catch, except, of course, Edward Bloom, who caught him by hand and then released him. To hear him tell, William's life, or Edward's life, was an endless succession of big fish stories. And as William uh, grows up, he comes to believe that his father's stories, he's using to distance himself emotionally from his family, particularly from his son. So when he gets old enough, he leaves home to escape the stories. He, he goes to college, he begins a career, and finally finds his own true love, and he marries her. And as the movie begins, it's been three years since William and his father, Edward, have spoken to each other because they had a fight on the night of William's wedding. They fought over what else? Edward's stories, these, these magical stories he told. William was tired of them. And he said, that's it, I don't want to hear anymore. And they didn't talk after that. And so William has now come home. He's come home for two reasons. First, he's just discovered that he's also about to become a father. He wants to share that, that news with his family. And second, his mother had called him to say that his father, Edward, was dying of cancer. 
So he flies home to see him for one last time in the hopes that he and his father might find some common ground upon which to reconcile their lives. He goes to his bedroom and he says to him, Dad, I want you to tell me the story of your life, the true story. Not the one about giants and werewolves. And that's where the film starts with William sitting by his father's bedside asking him, tell me the story of your life. And as they're talking, he says, Dad, aren't you concerned about dying? And Edward responds, no, because this is not where my story ends. How do you know that, William says. And Edward tells a story that sets the tone for the film. It takes place when Edward is a boy of 10. And he and some friends go to the house of an old woman who lived beyond the swamps near his Alabama hometown. And rumor has it she's a witch. And she has a glass eye. And as Edward tells it, if you looked right into that eye, you could see how you were going to die. When they get there to the ivory-colored cabin, they're all terrified, and they dare each other to walk up and knock on the door, but only Edward has the courage. The other boys run back into the swamp to hide and to watch, and Edward goes up to the house, and he reaches up to knock, and suddenly the door swings open, and there is an old crone with tangled hair wearing an eye patch. Ma'am, he says, my name is Edward Bloom, and there's some folks here who'd like to take a look into your eye. He leads her back to the place where the boys are hiding, and she glowers, and she flips up the eye patch. And one of them sees his own death. He falling off a ladder as an old man. He runs away in fear. Another one looks in, sees his death, runs away in fear, leaving Edward all alone. She flips the eye patch back down, and Edward says to her, You know, I was thinking about death and all, and seeing how we're all going to die. I mean, on the one hand, if dying was all you ever thought about, it'd kind of screw you up. But it also could kind of help you, wouldn't it? If you knew how you were going to die, because then everything else would be okay, because you were going to survive it. And the old woman smiles, and she flips up her eye patch, and Edward looks into the eye long and deep, and he says with a smile, Huh, so that's how I'm going to go. And then he finishes his story, he says to his son, And from that moment on, I never feared death. I, I sat by my dad's bedside as he lay dying. He could not speak to me. And that was okay, because... He had already said everything that needed to be said to me in the weeks before. Dad and I had a good relationship. Not everybody can say that about their father, but I can. And I realize now in the years that he has left, my father's spirit continues to kind of speak through me. I tell his stories. I remember his jokes and anecdotes. A music director gave me a plaque a couple of months ago that said, you're entitled to your ridiculous opinion. Because she's heard me say that so often, that's because that's what my dad used to say to me just about every day. You're entitled to your ridiculous opinion. I still see his face and hear his voice. He is still very much a part of who I am in ways I really cannot fairly articulate. And yet the most remarkable truth about my father's life, I learned on the day of his viewing, on the day of his funeral. I always thought I knew how respected and well-liked he was, but I had no idea. On the day of his viewing, we got there early to find this long line of people already waiting to pay their respects. We shook hands with those who came and came and came and came and came, dozens of them, then hundreds, then nearly a thousand people in this small church in this small town. For hour after hour they came, they snaked around the building, they embraced us and told us stories about, about his life, about how my dad helped them in a pinch, gave them their first job, spoke to them words of encouragement, treated them like family in times of trouble. They remembered his smile, his gentle generosity, his unfailing his enduring friendship, the many times he helped them with money, and the most remarkable thing to me, the stories. My God, story after story after story. Stories that shaped them and stories they remembered and shared with us. I, I knew the man. I loved the father. I had no idea about the breadth and depth of his life, how he had affected so many people. So there was great sadness on that day, to be sure, but there was also great joy and gratitude. And I realize that part of what I am called to do is to live that story and to tell that story. The last scene in the movie Big Fish um, is pretty remarkable. It's about as memorable a scene as you'll find in Hollywood. Edward has a stroke at home. And they rush him to the hospital and he wakes up and he can't speak. And for a man who's a, who's a salesman, trust me, that's the worst thing that can happen, he can't speak. So. He wants to finish his story, but he can't talk anymore. So he wakes up and he starts to panic. And William is there sitting by his bedside and he sees his distress and says, Dad, you want me to call a nurse? You want me to give you some water? Uh, Edward shakes his head and finally he gets it out. He says, William, 
I want you to tell the end of my story. And William says, how can I tell you a story that I've never heard? But Edward insists, and so he sits there because William, after all, is a writer. <laughs> he says he'll try, but he needs to know how the end of the story begins. It begins now, Edward whispers, it begins right here. So William thinks for a moment, he looks at his dad, and here's what he says. They were in the hospital, and morning has come, but somehow you're better, you're different. And Edward, now in the story, sits up in his bed. He says to William, get me out of here. And William grabs the nearest wheelchair, and they all make a mad dash for the hospital door, dodging orderlies and nurses who are trying to stop them until they get to the parking lot. And then William continues the story, and your old red charger is there, Dad, but it's brand spanking new, brand new. I pick you up and carry you, you hardly weigh a thing. I can't even explain it. They get into the car and Edward says, I need water. And William hands him a bottle. He says, no, I need you to take me to the water. Take me to the river. And they peel out of the lot going as fast as they can. They get to downtown, but the traffic is stopped. And they can't move on. And, and suddenly out of the side street comes a giant named Carl, one of his earlier stories, who picks the car up and moves it out of the way. <laughs> and so they finally get down to the river and William looks and in wonder, he says, Dad, everyone is here. I mean, everyone. It's unbelievable. And now you're back in the hospital, and Edward from his deathbed mumbles, well, of course they are. It is, after all, my story. And William, now back in the story, picks his father up out of the car and carries him past all the people that were the subject of his stories. Past Carl the Giant and Amos the Circus Ringmaster. Past the Beeman, the mayor of the most perfect town in the world, and Jenny, the witch with a glass eye. All the people of his stories, all smiling and waving, all cheering him on, back to the water, back to the river. And the strange thing is, William says, there's not a sad face in the crowd. Everyone is so glad to see you and send you off right. And Will carries him down to the river where his wife, Sandra, the love of his life, is waiting. And he gently touches her chin, he takes his ring off and lays it in her hand. And then William gently lowers him into the water where magically he turns into a giant catfish and swims away. And suddenly you're back in the hospital room. And the sun is setting and the darkness is deepening. And William finishes. And you become what you always were, Dad. A very big fish. And that's how it ends. And in this beautiful moment of reconciliation, Edward reaches out and touches him. And with his last breath, he says, Exactly. Exactly. We're all born into families, aren't we? On this Father's Day, I want you to remember the family into which we are all born. It's not just the family of blood. It's a family of water. We call it the church. These are hard days for the church. Most of us who still sit in these pews try to keep up a brave front, but the truth is, the church as we know it is dying. That's just the truth. Since we believe in resurrection in the church, that's not such a bad thing, by the way. It's just a new thing. My father told me when I entered ministry, be careful, Craig, because the church is the only army that shoots its wounded. <laughs> One of our respected retired bishops once wrote, it seems to me we're living in the last days of the church as we once knew it. In these last days, though, the church finds itself both judged by and sustained by God's grace. So maybe it's time for us, like Edward Bloom, to go back to the water, go back to the river. Revisit the waters of our baptism from which this family is born. Perhaps it is time to hear anew the voice of our Father, to remember His Spirit that speaks through us and in us. Time to find the courage to say the things that everybody knows is true but are afraid to articulate, to love people enough to tell them the things they don't want to hear, and to speak to those who may not be ready to listen, to flip up the eye patch, peer into the glass eye, and then live our lives bravely. Because whether the church lasts another 10 years or another 10,000 10, years, that's not the point. Telling the story of Jesus, that's the point. Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. 
Do not worry about what you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given you at that time, for it is not you who speak, it's the spirit of your Father who speaks through you. We are called to tell the story of our Father, to bear the story in joy and in wonder to each other and to this world. We are his voice. We speak by the power of the Holy Spirit. We remember the promise he made to us that wherever two or three of us gather in his name, even two or three, he is there in the midst of us to support us and teach us what it means to be family, to remind us what it means to be sustained by his grace, to remind us what is worth remembering and what it means to live in that grace and make a difference in this world of death. The novel Big Fish ends a little differently from the movie. I want to read it to you. On the day people heard that Edward had died, they began to gather in the front yard of his house. First a few, but soon more and more until dozens were standing around trampling the shrubbery and treading on the monkey grass until finally William's mother asked him to go out and tell them to leave. So he does, but as they are leaving, one man stops and says to him, you know, William, we all have stories. Ways in which your dad touched us and helped us and gave us jobs and lent us money and sold it to us wholesale. Lots of stories, big and small, and they all add up. Over a lifetime, they all add up. And that's why we're here. We're a part of him of who he is, just as he is a part of us. And that, dear people, is why we are here on this Father's Day. Because we are a part of him, of who he is, just as he is a part of us. And that, that is a story that is worth telling. To God be the glory.